Good evening. Good evening. If you would, grab your Bibles. Uh, We're going to be in Genesis chapter 38 tonight. Tonight we're going to study the story of Judah and Tamar. Judah and Tamar, Genesis chapter 38. I'm not going to put everything uh, from the text up on the screen tonight, so I would recommend grabbing your Bible if you'd like to follow along. Physically speaking, uh, these two, Judah and Tamar, are in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Uh, and they are Jesus is in the flesh, great, 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 however many times great, grandparents. And this story tells about how the family line went from Judah, the son of Jacob, to Judah's son Perez, uh, by his daughter-in-law Tamar. I always used to think that this was a very random story uh, when you, I'd come across it in the book of Genesis. Have you ever thought that? You know, you'll just begin reading the awesome story of Joseph and how his older brother sold him into slavery. And at the end of chapter 37, he's sold to a man named Potiphar who lives in Egypt. Then chapter 39, throughout the close of the book of Genesis, are, is all about Joseph and how he rose to the top. Uh, in the land of Egypt. And God uses him uh, to save Jacob and his uh, 11 brothers. And uh, that's really when the children of Israel first enter into Egypt. That's the whole story of, of Jacob. Hey, Joe, could you shut that just a little bit? Or either turn the fan down. It's kind of blowing these. Thank you. Let's see if that works. So here's this story. Um, and one of, let's see, where am I at? Sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> um, you got distracted. Yep. Okay, so we're talking about the story of Joseph. In the middle of the story of Joseph, right, um, we read this event in chapter 38 that seems very random. And it's, it's completely, seems very unrelated to everything that's going on in Egypt with Joseph and, and all of that. And so one of Joseph's 11 brothers, Judah, unknowingly has a child with his daughter-in-law. You say he unknowingly has a child by his daughter-in-law. How's that go? Um, and this is just smack in the middle of the story of Joseph. And we ask ourselves, why in the world did God tell us this story? And you know, why did we need to know this in, in the Bible? It, it really has just nothing in the world, it seems like, to do with, with the story of Joseph. You know, one of the themes I want you to take home tonight is that everything written down in Scripture, God put there for a reason. Okay. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit to write. So there are no wasted words or filler stories. I just wanted to tell you this just because it's kind of a neat story. Because the Holy Spirit was guiding these men to write the books. And with exactly the words that the Father wanted to be down on paper for us to have for all time. But the question is, well, what is it that the Father wanted us to know? Why did he want us to know this story? At the time of Jesus Christ, the story of Judah and Tamar suddenly gain so much more significance than it ever had before. When mankind realized that this story tells us about the passing seed that would bring Jesus Christ into the world. Right, so this story has to do with tracing the line of Christ through the seed line of Judah. Uh, and if you remember, you know, this, uh, God promised Abraham that through his descendants, the whole world would be blessed. Through one of his descendants, a, a particular individual. Someone would come in the future from your physical family line, Abraham, who is going to bring about a blessing to the whole world. And of course, that offspring would be one of the divine members of the Godhead who was born into a physical body, and his name was Jesus. Then God continued his promise through Abraham's son, Isaac. And between Isaac's twin sons, Jacob and Esau, God designated Jacob to continue the seed over Esau. Then you get toward uh, the last third of the book of Genesis, and Jacob has 12 sons. 
Who's it going to go through? The spotlight focus of the whole story in the book of Genesis is on Joseph. And you would think that the seed line would go through him. But it doesn't. God chose Judah, the fourth in line, over all the other 11 brothers by which the seed would continue. God, in his all-knowing, infinite wisdom, chose to continue the seed through him, through Judah. And you know, so we can, you can see what God is doing here when he's telling the story of Joseph. In chapter 38, he pauses for a moment to show, you know, here's this important thing that's happening uh, in the land of Egypt. But by the way, I want to give you this story that happens. And he tells us about Judah having a son by his daughter-in-law. And we jump right back into the story of Joseph. Because you see, the Old Testament never neglects to show us the line of Jesus Christ. It always gives us a glimpse of, of how it was happening, who it was happening with. For these 2,000 years of history between Abraham and Jesus, we have every generation that we need to know. So I would like to go through the events of this interesting story tonight uh, so that you can know how God used their choices, and I, I suppose you might say their bad choices, to bring about the next individual to host the seed of Jesus Christ in his lineage. So there is some sin involved in this story. You know, when we talk about what these men and women did, it doesn't justify it, right? They did some sinful things, and especially in this story. We see some deception in this story. But God chose this man and this woman to continue the line of Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bibles, let's uh, start reading in Genesis chapter 38 and verse 1. In Genesis 38 and verse 1. In your Bible. So I'm, I'm not going to put up every verse on the screen because uh, I'm going to be using a diagram so that you get the uh, lineage uh, down. So Genesis chapter 38 and verse 1. The Bible says, It came to pass that Judah departed from his brothers. And a certain uh, Adulamite who's, uh, and, and he visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he married her and went into her. Okay, so Judah gets a wife who is a Canaanite. Verse 3, So she conceived and bore a son and called his name Ur. So first son, his name is Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. And she conceived yet again and bore a son and called his name, uh, I'm going to say Shelah. And she was, and he was at uh, Chezeb when she bore him. So there's three sons here, bore to Judah. Then Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn. So I'm gonna, I found a wife for you, and her name was Tamar. And uh, it says, but Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. So I would like to know a little bit more about that story, but that's kind of all it wraps it up uh, with is. Ur was wicked. God killed him for it. And, you know, I also want to note what seems to already be a, a mistake on Judah's part, if you will. We see that, that Judah departs from his home to a foreign land, and he ends up marrying a Canaanite woman. And, you know, let me just uh, point out why this would be problematic for Judah spiritually. Okay. First, Judah is leaving a group of people who were raised to follow the one true God of heaven, Jehovah. Okay, we know uh, that they were under the roof of a father named Jacob who was attempting to follow the one true God. He tried to teach his children about the true God. Not that they did great about following him. But secondly, Judah left his home and he ended up marrying a Canaanite. But, you know, throughout the centuries... The Canaanites were known for being caught up in idolatry and paganism, and Judah marries one of them. And we say throughout Scripture, not a good idea, right? You might remember back to Genesis chapter 24, uh, when Abraham was urging his servant to go and find a wife for his son Isaac. Do you remember that? And the text reads, So Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, he said to his servant, Please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters 
of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. Now, it doesn't specify in this chapter exactly why Abraham specified that I don't want my son Isaac to marry a Canaanite. But my guess is it has to do with paganism and sinfulness, okay? A different religion than the God of heaven. Uh, they, they worship the stars and the creation more than they worship the creator. So Abraham says, don't let Isaac take a daughter of the Canaanites, whatever you do, or he and his descendants will not be faithful to the Lord. And here we see three generations later, Abraham's great-grandson, Judah, taking a daughter from among the Canaanites. You know, Betty asked me the other day if I would maybe do a lesson eventually uh, about Solomon's wives and how they turned his heart away from serving the Lord. Solomon had 700 wives in the Old Testament and 300 concubines. In 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 4, the Bible says, For it was so when Solomon was old that his wives did what? Turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. So this was a, I suppose you could say, dangerous fire that Judah was playing with. Right? If she would have been a faithful woman, great, serving the Lord. Uh, but the first thing we see in this story is that Judah married a Canaanite, and what happens? Their first son dies before God because he was wicked in the sight of the Lord, the Bible says. So, you know, point number one, I'm going to draw out five points from this story as we go along. We'll keep coming back to our five points. But here's one point for our lives today. Number one, I think we need to understand this in the church. Children are influenced by both parents. Isn't that true? You know, if, if, if you have one parent who's trying to serve God, and then one parent who could care less, or could not care less, and is living a life of sin, a lot of times, who does the child follow? The sinful parent. Oh, my mama's doing this, I might as well, daddy's doing this. That's why Christians need to be careful. And it's very beneficial to marry another Christian. It would be right. Uh, because if one parent is wicked, there's a good chance a child will chase after those same things. And I think that's what you have here in the story. Judah's first son, Ur, died before the Lord because of wickedness. I can only imagine the Canaanite influence of paganism and idolatry in that household. It doesn't say exactly why he died, but uh, Judah's first son dies. And that leaves Tamar, what? A widow. Let's read verse 8 of Genesis chapter 38. It says, uh, And Judah said to Onan, that is the second son, Go into your brother's wife and marry her, and raise up an heir to your brother. But Onan knew uh, that the heir would not be his. And it came to pass, when he went into his brother's wife, that he emitted on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. The King James Version says he spilled his seed on the ground. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord. Therefore, he killed him also. See Nancy laughing back there. Don't mess with the God of heaven with his commandments, right? So you've got two dead sons, right? Because they displeased the Lord. And you might say, now, what is the deal with this part of the story? Why did God get so upset with Onan here? I assume that it was part of God's law at the time. Uh, that if one brother died, the next oldest brother would have to perform the duty towards his deceased brother's wife. I say that I assume because although we don't read this command for the patriarchs uh, before this time of, in the book of Genesis, in the law of Moses, which was given after this, that's exactly what God commanded the children of Israel and in, in the, the family of, of Abraham. Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 5, in the Old Testament, which we're not under today, the Bible says... If brothers dwell together, and one of them dies, and has no son, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as his wife, and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be, now listen to this part, that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother. And this name or that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. So 
I would imagine, based on God's anger at the second son Onan here, uh, that God implemented a law very similar to this under the patriarchal dispensation. That's what uh, they're following. And if that is the case, which I believe the inference is that that was the case, Onan would have been, uh, would have had the commandment from God to take his brother's wife, or his, his brother's widow, and produce an offspring in his brother's name so that his name would not be blotted out of the seed. So that's the command of God. What did Onan do? We see that Onan did not want to raise up an offspring for his brother, as God commanded. But the text says, it says here's why, because he knew that the heir would not be his. So Onan said, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to produce an heir for my brother. Because it, it, it'll, it'll be my son, but he doesn't technically belong to me. He'll wear the name of my, of my brother. And so it's kind of a selfish thing. Onan did not like God's commandment here. Verse 9 says, And it came to pass, when he went into his brother's wife, that he emitted on the ground, lest he should give heir, an heir to his brother. Okay, so the sin wasn't necessarily the spilling the seed on the ground, as some have argued in the past, but really it is rebellion against a direct command from God. He didn't do what he was supposed to do, his duty uh, to his brother's wife. So uh, Onan was supposed to go into his deceased brother's wife and produce an heir for his brother. But when he went to perform the duty, Onan rebelled against God's law and emitted his seed on the ground. Verse 10 says, And the thing which Onan did displeased the Lord, therefore he killed him also. Okay, so uh, let's recap. Uh, Judah and his Canaanite wife have three sons. God strikes two of them dead because of sin and rebellion against God's law. So that leaves one son left, uh, Shelah, okay, the, the third oldest. So now Tamar is to be passed to the next son. That's what's supposed to happen according to God's law. But let's see what happens. Verse 11. Verse 11 says, Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house until my son Shelah is grown. For he said, Lest he die also like his brothers. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. So instead of Judah giving Tamar to his third son, Shelah, uh, in accordance with, the God, with God's law, Judah sends Tamar to go live back home with her father. Okay. Notice Judah doesn't take care of her. right? But he says, stay with your father until my son, Shelah, is old enough to marry you. And then he'll take you. All right? He's too young right now. But I like how Scripture points out here really the real motivation as to why Judah did not give Tamar to his youngest son. And perhaps he was younger at the time. But the Bible says, I'm not going to give, him, give you to my son lest he also die like his brothers. Okay? So Judah did not want to give Tamar to his son because he was afra afraid that God would kill him too. I might lose all three of my sons because of disobedience to God. So it shows me, really, that Judah didn't have much faith in his third son to live faithfully to God. He said, I'm scared God's going to kill him for sinning, just like he killed his brothers. Now, I think that really attests to the sinfulness of the sons of Judah. Um, but now, I don't want you to miss the significance of Judah sending Tamar back to her father's house. Okay, This would have been a huge deal in Tamar's world, right? Uh, to be a widow... In this time period, with no husband, no family, really, no, no children uh, that would help you in your old age, was really tough living. Right? This was kind of uh, Naomi's predicament in the book of Ruth. Right? She was in trouble because that was her, in her position. She had no one to take care of her in that society. Because you see, once Tamar, and her, well, once her parents die, she's going to be a widow with no husband and no children to help. Okay, and that's a bad position to be in, especially terrible in that ancient society. Uh, it was not the same as today. She couldn't just go out and get a job. Um, so to Tamar, it is very important that Judah holds up his end of the bargain in giving his youngest son, once he becomes of age, as he promised. It's very important to her. Uh, but what we're going to see is that uh, the next few years, over the next few years, Judah delays, and he delays in giving Tamar to Shelah as a wife. 
And Judah does not honor his promise to Tamar. And in delaying, he's kind of going against God's law. That's what's supposed to happen. But you know, I'm just not going to let it happen. I'm kind of scared that he's going to die. So uh, now let's see what happens in verse 12. It says, Now in the process of time, okay, so some time has passed, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. Okay, so now Judah's two sons and his wife are dead. And Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shears in Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. So he goes on a little trip here. And it was told to Tamar, saying, Look, your father is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So he's going away. Verse 14 says, So she took off her widow's garment, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in the open place which was on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. I want you to remember that phrase. She saw that he was old enough, and Judah hadn't given her to him to be his wife. So as more and more time passes, you remember the exact reason Judah told Tamar that he wouldn't give her to his son. Oh, he's too young. Well, years go by. Shelah grows up, uh, and Judah still hasn't given Tamar to him as a wife, as God commanded. So what does Tamar do? She disguises herself, right? She took off her widow's garment. And what is she disguised as? A prostitute. Okay, and we're going to look more about this whole story. She disguises herself as a prostitute, sits along the road leading to Timnah, where uh, Judah is going to pass by. And verse 15 says, When Judah saw her, he thought she was a what? A harlot. That's what she was disguised as. He thought she was a harlot on the side of the road, a prostitute, because she had covered her face. Then he turned uh, to her by the way and said, Please let me come in to you. Let me have sexual relations with you. So not to speak of Judas' great sin here, right? Here's a prostitute. I'm going to go talk to this prostitute. And then it says here, For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. He didn't know who it was that uh, was the prostitute right here. So by the way, her disguise worked. Okay, he didn't know who it was. So she said, what will you give me uh, that I may, that you may come into me? What is your payment? And he said, my payment, I, I will send you a young goat of the flock. So I'm going to pay you a goat. So she said, will you give me a pledge until you send it? All right, so in other words, Tamar pretending to be the prostitute says, well, since you don't have the payment, the goat, right now, what are you going to give me as collateral in the meantime? I needed some kind of a pledge, something I'd know you're actually going to pay me. Then he said, what pledge shall I give you? What do you want? Okay. So she said, and this is an important part of the story, I want your signet and cord and your staff that is in your hand. So Tamar is going to get her hands on some items from Judah that he uses very often. He knows very well. His signet and his cord, right? A signet was kind of like a stamp that uh, individuals could sign letters with. And he would uh, do his little signet ring. And the the cord was likely uh, wrapped around his neck where it would hold his signet or some other uh, meaning. And then his staff, obviously, he went walked with it everywhere. So these three things he had all the time. Look at the rest of verse 18. I'll read the rest of verse 18, sorry. It says, Then he gave them to her and went into her. That means he had sexual relations with her, and she conceived by him. So Judah and Tamar, uh, Tamar conceived by Judah. So she arose and went away and laid aside her veil and put on the widow's garments again. So she went, all right, I'm a widow again. And Judah sent the young goat by the hand of, the, his, of his friend, the Adulamite. So he says, all right, I'm going to pay this prostitute who I just slept with to receive his pledge from the woman's hand. Um, but he did not find her. All right, go take the goat, get the signet ring and the cord back and, and the staff. Couldn't find her anyway, right? Because it was Tamar. And um, verse 21 says, Then he asked the men of that place, saying, where is the harlot who is openly by the roadside? Where is she? And they said, there was no harlot in this place. There's no harlot here. So he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. 
Also, the men of the place uh, said there was no harlot in this place. Then Judah said, let her take them for herself, lest we be shamed. Right? I mean, I don't want to chase this around and start asking everybody, lest I be shamed for sleeping with a prostitute. She can have the signet and the cord, and she can have my staff. For I sent this young goat, and you have not found her. I tried. Verse 24 says, It came to pass about three months after that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. So I guess you could say three months later, this thing's been concealed for three months, but I guess you could say the baby bump starts showing. Can't get around it anymore. Tamar's pregnant. So Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. Say, wow, bring her out. We're going to burn her. We're going to kill my daughter-in-law for sleeping with somebody by harlotry and she is conceived. When she was brought out, now here's, I guess, the culmination of her plan, right? So when she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, Please determine whose these are, the signet and cord and staff. Can you imagine when Judah saw his signet, his cord, and his staff? Verse 26 says, So Judah acknowledged them and said, she has been more righteous than I, because I did not give her Shalah my son. And Judah never knew her again. That means he never had sexual relations with her again. Verse 27, Now it came to pass, at the time for giving birth, that behold, twins were in her womb. And so it was when she was giving birth uh, that one put his hand out, put out his hand, and the midwife, the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand, saying, This one came out first. Then it happened, as he drew back his hand right into his mother's womb, that his brother came out unexpectedly. And she said, How did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out, who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zara. So that's the text. And we find out later in the New Testament uh, that this little baby that broke through before his brother, and his name was Perez, was the baby that passed the seed of Jesus Christ to the next generation. All right, the seed had traveled, as was promised, from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Judah and now to his little baby Perez, okay? And he's the next in line by the mother, who was the daughter-in-law, Tamar. And he was the next generation of the line of Jesus Christ. So what a crazy, event-filled story. You know, I, I read these fine details in the Bible and try to put these stories together, and I just say to myself, nobody can make this stuff up. Right? I, I don't care who the writer would be. If this was a human writer, they couldn't make this stuff up. What was Tamar's plan in disguising herself as a prostitute? Her plan was to conceive and bear a child by Judah uh, so that she could stay in the family, so she could be protected. And her plan worked. Now, there are some people who tried to justify what Tamar did here, and they'll say, Man, she, she had no choice. This was a desperation act uh, to produce an heir. Well, Tamar was still sinning, okay? We have to understand it was still a violation of God's law. And Judah was certainly sinning. So these are not two pure people here that God used in the line of Christ. We're just getting the story. Here's what happened. Here's who it went through. Uh, but these individuals are in the line of Jesus Christ, his descendants physically. And, I, you know, I, before we get to our main points, I, I might ask this question and answer it really quick. Because I used to wonder this when I'd read the story. How in the world did Judah have sexual relations with Tamar without recognizing her the whole time. I thought that, you know, and skeptics will say that. I mean, she, when she was on the road, the Bible says that she had her face covered. But skeptics will say, so you're telling me Tamar went unrecognized by Judah the whole time? It was his daughter-in-law? And, you know, he, he lied with her, and he didn't realize that it was her the whole time. 
let me give you two very logical possibilities um, as to why Judah did not recognize Tamar the whole time and why this is not an illogical. You know, some people say, see, that's a fairy tale. It doesn't make any sense. Well, it makes perfect sense. Number one, perhaps Tamar, here's a possibility, perhaps Tamar did keep her face hidden the whole time. It's very possible. It said she kept it hidden on the road. So maybe Tamar really did pull this off. I don't think that's an impossibility. Maybe she's, that's what prostitutes did. No, you can't see my face. Um, but I also want you to think of the se- second option when skeptics try to come and, s- and say, this is ridiculous how he couldn't recognize her. Well, perhaps Judah hadn't seen Tamar for quite some time. I want you to think about the timeline here. I'm talking years. You say, well, how's that? You know, I want you to think back to when Onan, the second son, if we go back to the timeline, when Onan died and Judah, Judah sent Tamar to live back at her father's house. Remember that part of the story? And Judah's excuse was what? Well, my third son, Shalah, he's, he's not old enough yet. Go live with your father until he's grown, and then I will give you my son. All right, so I don't know how old Shalah was uh, when, when Judah uh, was you know, claiming that he's too young. But let's say that he was 17 years old. Let's just use this scenario. He's 17. He's a little bit young. He's not quite an adult yet. Um, well, if Tamar goes and lives with her father until Shalah gets older, I wonder how long Judah goes without seeing Tamar. How long has it been? Perhaps by the time Tamar deceives Judah on the road, it's four or five years later. Right? The text uh, does say that Tamar sees that Shalah is grown at the time. And the Judah had not given uh, her as a, to him as a wife yet. So let's say five years passes. Shalah is 22 years old. And Tamar says, Shalah is old enough now, certainly. And he hasn't been given to, I haven't been given to him as a wife. I don't think it's going to happen. So I think it's very likely that when Judah comes into contact with Tamar on the road, it has been quite some time since they've even seen each other. Okay, I think that's a great possibility. Have you ever, I, know, I, I was only in high school a little while ago. I'll see somebody and be like, I, I, didn't, I didn't recognize you. You know, it's been four or five, you know, however long it was. Anyways, let's close, um, let's close with our final four points from this story. Uh, what can we learn from this story? There's some great lessons here. Number one, we learned that through Judah's choice to marry the Canaanite woman that, you know, children are influenced by both parents. And... Uh, His sons were wicked. Number two, uh, let me know if you think this principle applies to this story. Uh, Number two, be sure your sin will find you out. Now, I stole that wording, of course, from Numbers chapter 32 and verse 23. But I, I want you to think about how it applies to this story. Be sure your sin will find you out. When Judah was far from home, away from his brothers away from his his father. He finds a prostitute on the side of the road. No doubt he thinks, oh, I can get away with this. Right? No one back home will ever find out about this. But little does he know his sin won't be concealed for very long. Because three months later, he probably thinks he's probably gotten away with it completely uh, with sleeping with this prostitute. And to his surprise, it comes to the forefront before all the people back home, and it's made known. The Bible teaches that sooner or later, your sin will be found out. Whether it's now or the judgment day, it'll be made known. And everyone is going to know about our sin. There's not going to be a secret. So the Bible says, don't try to hide it. Don't try to fool yourself into thinking you're going to get away with it. I'm going to keep it a secret forever. Because God sees all things. And often our sins are found out much sooner than we would like. A lot of times they're found out in this life. Has that ever happened to you? You try to conceal something and then someone finds out about it. Number three, how about this one? Judge not hypocritically. Judge not hypocritically. I find it so interesting in this story that Judah... Learns when he learns of Tamar being found with a child by harlotry, that he is so quick to say, I want you to bring her out and let's burn her because she had a child by harlotry. When he 
slept with a harlot only three months earlier. Now that's hypocritical judgment. That's what the Bible condemns as judgment. You can't judge somebody when you're caught up in the very same thing. You see, Judah was so ready to condemn and ready to put her to death when he was guilty of the very same thing she was. He had no mercy in his heart. Oh, she messed up. Let's kill her. So I just find this story so ironic. Uh, He's ready to put Tamar to death for being a harlot with someone, and he finds out, oh, it was with me. And he didn't know it was with him. That's just interesting to me. Point number four. I just want to point out that, number four, the lineage of Christ is unbelievably complex. If you study this throughout Scripture, this is just one story in 42 generations from Abraham to Jesus Christ written about. And in fact, in Luke's account, it lists 55 generations when you count it from Mary's side of the family. You know, because Jesus had two physical parents. One of them didn't come through the seed. But um, the passing seed of Jesus Christ was, is so much more, has so much more going on than I think any of us can ever wrap our heads around. So many generations of people. When you consider how complex this one story is that we just studied tonight and how things with Judah and Tamar had to happen just the way they did, and God fulfilled... And what are the chances when you looked at the beginning of the story that you said, oh, I bet you I know what's going to happen. The father-in-law is going to sleep with the daughter-in-law. Do you think that's going to happen? Right? And it just... uh, We see how incredibly vast the mind of God is to plan this out and to use these situations to bring about the seed of Jesus Christ into the world through sinful people and bring about the Savior. You know, take a peek at this chart. I don't, you probably can't really see it. You can just see how complex it is. Uh, about how many individuals are involved in fulfilling the promise to Abraham from all these generations, right? The book of Matthew lists uh, Jesus' family through the line of Joseph. The book of Luke lists Jesus' family line through Mary. And it's just crazy to think about how many individuals were involved and carried the seed of Jesus Christ. And God said to Abraham, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Who knew that this would be the end of his plan? All of these many 2,000 years later it was. Point number five, and lastly, I see this theme in the story of Judah and Tamar. God can use all things to work for good. God can use all things to work for good. You know, we saw a lot of sin in this story. It wasn't God that caused them to sin. The people sinned, and he used their decisions. We saw Judah neglect his duty to give his daughter-in-law to his youngest son like he was supposed to. We saw the daughter-in-law pose as a prostitute in order to have a child. We saw this daughter-in-law deceive her father-in-law. We saw the father-in-law willfully thinking that he's going to go sleep with a prostitute. And, uh, you know... And yet God used these people to host the seed of Jesus Christ to bring about salvation to all mankind. God used sinful people to bring about this plan. God worked providentially to bring good from evil. You know, God can use people's wicked choices and turn them into accomplishing something good. And he's done that throughout history. Think about how Judas, he used Judas's betrayal of Jesus Christ and the Jews who handed him over because of envy and all of that sin leading into the crucifixion and God used their sinful choices to accomplish his plan. You know, it's kind of like when Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. It was such a terrible situation and God used that scenario to bring about a great salvation to the 11 brothers and the seed of Abraham working off of their bad decision. And I'll close with this point. I just want you to think about how interesting this is. Um, It's interesting to note that in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, only four women are mentioned in that list. In those lists, we always read, you know, he was the son of this man, the son of this man, the son of this man. But four women are mentioned and specified. There were more than that, more women than that. But only four are mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Do you know who those four women are? Maybe you, you can already name them. Number one. It's Tamar, a Canaanite woman who tricked her father-in-law into sleeping with her. 
Number two, Rahab, a Canaanite prostitute who hid the Jewish spies. Number three, Ruth, a Moabite woman who married Boaz, slept at his feet. And fourthly, about Bathsheba, a Hittite woman who committed adultery with King David. So these are the four women, isn't that interesting, that are mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And by the way, not, not a one of them was a Jew by birth. So each of them entered this family line marrying into uh, the Jewish family. And God used what might be seen as you know, less than wholesome people to continue the seed of Jesus Christ. But each of these women did something in faith to pursue the family line and to be associated with the God of heaven. Think of the choices of these four women. You know, with Tamar, of course, she diligently sought to be part of this family. She wanted to keep being part of this family. Rahab, she left her prostitution that she was formerly in, and she married uh, Solomon after the Jews captured Jericho. Sounded like she turned things around. And in the New Testament, it talks about by faith. Ruth followed her mother-in-law, Naomi, and adopted Naomi's faith in God, which led her to the marriage with Boaz. And Bathsheba was one of the key individuals in making sure that Solomon took the throne of David after him, and it succeeded through him. So, you know, each of these women were in less than desirable circumstances, but each, but, but God used them to continue the seed of Jesus Christ that would save the world. So the point is, just think about what, what good God can accomplish through us today, even though we have sin in our life and we've done terrible things, if we'll just turn to him with all of our might. So God can do great things. So that's the lesson tonight. Um, if you're not a Christian, you've got to become a part of God's new spiritual family, his church. And you have to obey the gospel to do that, to become a child of God. You have to hear the gospel. You have to believe it with all your heart that Jesus Christ died on that cross for our sins. It can wash away our sins and wipe them away. You have to believe that. You have to repent of your sins. You can't just continue, have a mindset of, I'm just going to sin all I want. You have to repent of your sins, which is a change of mind that's going to lead to a change of life. You have to confess Jesus Christ before men. And you have to uh, lastly be immersed, baptized in water for the forgiveness of those sins. Rise up a new creature to live life faithfully in the Lord's church to be faithful unto death. So if anybody would like to be baptized tonight, the water's ready. And if anybody who's in the church would like to come forward for repentance and prayers, please come while we stand and sing the invitation song. Father, forgive us when in our